Hi everyone and welcome to our third edition of Competency Corner Live. We're super excited to be back here again answering all of your questions about competencies and how competencies can help you make better talent decisions. With me today is my esteemed colleague, Dr. Nicholas Bremner. Welcome, Nicholas. Thank you. Good to be here. So we're very uh, excited to have Nicholas joining us today. Uh, Nicholas actually joined HRSG, HRSG within the last year yep. um, as our Director of Research and Analytics. So, you know, it's a great new addition to the team and we are very excited and thankful to have all of his expertise uh, both today on our event as well as just generally <laughs> within the organization. Um, so, we have received a few questions coming into us in advance of our Q&A session today, but I obviously encourage everyone listening to keep those questions coming in. Um, you know, maybe we'll, we'll try to stump them. At some point, we're going to turn this into a game show, and it's going to be called Stump the Consultant. So, we'll, <laughs> we'll see what we can do here. Um, so, our first question that we have comes to us from Neil. This is actually a question that we received in follow-on to a webinar that we did last month uh, that Nicholas participated in, um, speaking specifically around culture fit. So if you haven't checked out the event, check it out. You can find a recording on our website in our resources hub. Okay, so the question is, um, some believe that hiring for culture fit can quickly become a smokescreen for old-fashioned discrimination. We talked about this quite yeah. a bit. Yeah, we did. Uh, so meaning that people, um, hiring people who are like you. Uh, this can come with many challenges like discrimination against other mindsets or values. So wh what do you think about this? Any, any thoughts or comments? Yeah, um, so first of all, thanks for the question, Neil. Um, appreciate you submitting it. It's a good question and with you know, the, the increasing popularity of culture, it's something important uh, for us to think about. Um, I, I, it's, a, it's a legitimate problem and it's probably partly the case because culture is a difficult concept to define. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of all-encompassing, it's all around us. Um, part of it's observable, part of it's not. Um, so when you're looking, let's, let, let's use a hiring example, um, for instance. And so if you're looking to hire a new employee uh, and you want to make sure they fit with your culture or just fit, and you walk into the interview with a very vague notion of what fit looks like, um, you may not know what questions to ask, you may try and get a general sense of the candidate. Um, do I like this person? Do I think they fit in well here? That's where the danger comes in. That's where all these biases can kind of creep in. Um, so, but if you actually do the work to define culture and then define actually how culture helps your organization and helps the goals, um, you can actually come prepared with questions that you know will help you uh, understand what kind of person this is and how that relates to the job, how it relates to the organization, um, and help you make a better decision. And then ask the different people the same questions and really guard yeah. against those biases. Well, and I think just leading from that, I mean, competencies turn into a really great tool for, for doing this. Yeah, um, for sure. You know, because you can set that common foundation, that common framework upon which you're looking for particular behaviors to bring in, that people possess to bring into the organization. If I think back at, you know, HRSG has gone through a major growth spurt in the mm -hmm. last year, and we've added, we've almost doubled in size. Um, and we've done this with, I don't know that we've lost anybody that have, has come on. We've had incredible culture fit, and I think this really does speak to the, the power that using those core competencies that really right. embody the culture of an organization, but in behavioral terms, can really have a significant impact on an organization's growth. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Um, yeah. There's a clear link there between cultures and those general competencies, and doing the work to actually define what competencies are really key mm -hmm for the entire organization's success and that are important for everyone in the organization to exhibit uh, is a really good step to kind of defining your culture and understanding um, what it looks like when someone really fits in. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next question because we have been getting a few other ones here, but I'm going to keep going with the ones we've received in advance. Sure. Um, so this comes to us from John. Are there differences between the competencies of an organization and uh, or the competencies that an organization is looking for versus those that individuals possess? Um, uh, the, I, I guess the answer to this question would be kind of depends. Um, I can answer it from different perspectives. So if you're talking about um, a skills mismatch or a competence mismatch between organizations in general and candidates or people applying, um, there's kind of conflicting evidence in the labor market saying that you know there might be some skill shortages in some areas, but in other, in other areas it's not a huge concern. Um, but I think it really depends on the organization. It's, it's difficult to kind of generalize and, and make a statement about that. 
Uh, what I would say is that it's important to actually first define um, what competencies you're looking for before you can even really answer the question. So you need to define the competencies that are required in your organization and then you can actually measure whether or not people in your organization possess those competencies and then you can really determine if there's a mismatch there. Um, but it's kind of a difficult question to answer in general terms. Well, and I think that th that's a, sort of the objective of what a, a lot of our clients are trying to achieve through their competency initiatives. Right. So what, you know, what are the requirements of the jobs across the organization or you know, at that top level of the core competencies to really maintain that competitive advantage, advantage let's say, yeah. um, of a company? And how, do the, how does an, the employee's skills match? Um, so looking at that, whether it's through assessment, through you know what other means, and then putting that development program in place to address any potential gaps where there is a mismatch. Yeah, because before you do that, it's really kind of a black box. Um, yeah. A lot of organizations will use uh, individual performance as kind of a, a proxy or a, a general gauge of whether there's a skills mismatch. Mm -hmm. um, but you really can't answer the question for certain until you yeah. do some kind of analysis there. Cool. Okay, so next question comes to us from Anne. What does legally defensible competencies mean? And okay. how are they defensible? What makes competencies defensible? Okay, um, thanks for your question, Anne. I'll start by saying I'm not a lawyer, so please don't take this as legal <laughs> we'll advice. We'll call in our, C uh, our chief legal officer for some advice on this. Yeah, sure. Um, what, what I can say about it is that uh, legal defensibility um, with competencies and mm -hmm. with other areas of, of talent management and HR, it boils down to avoiding discrimination. It boils down to ensuring their subjectivity in terms of how HR policies are applied. So when it comes to competencies, um, using a hiring situation as an example again, mm -hmm. uh, competencies can be used to define what's required to be successful in a role. Um, and it avoids, kind of what we talked about earlier actually with, um, with culture fit and avoiding those discrimination and, the, and those biases, getting a general sense of whether I like this person or not. That's when uh, you have grounds for a lack of legal defensibility. Um, competencies can help provide a more Legal def legally defensible uh, selection program by you know protecting against uh, discrimination in, in various ways. Yeah. Great, I, I you know that question brought up some uh, memories of mine of a client that we worked with a few years back, OPSU. So they're one of the um, labor groups, the union groups here in Ontario, okay. and they chose to go with a competency-based approach really because of that reason, because of the defensibility that the competencies lend to their processes. Um, and I believe they were looking at both on the selection and then the development side and even getting into performance where, you know, things can always be a little con contentious, especially in that unionized type of, type of environment. Right. Um, but the competencies really gave them that, you know, again, going back to that solid backing, that foundation for making those decisions. Yeah. Um, and documenting those decisions so that it should something arise down the road, you know, there is that material to fall back on to say, okay, this is why we made these decisions. This is yep. what, you know, drove that. Exactly. That yeah. Yeah. It's about good measurement, good documentation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if there is some kind of a grievance or complaint, mm -hmm. you have all your ducks in a row, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and it's something that you definitely should do in advance and not wait until, you know, something happens to actually do it. Great. Okay. So, this, I like this next question. So this comes to us from Zoe. Okay. How do I identify competen competencies for jobs in an emerging field? Okay, that's a good question. Um, thanks for your question, Zoe. Uh, an emerging field, so I'm gonna take it to assume that you might mean an, uh, a position that's uh, kind of new or didn't exist previously and is increasing in number or, or didn't mm -hmm. exist before. Um, really, it boils down to doing research about the position itself. Um, I'd say a first step is given that even new positions uh, for now exist within organizations, so a good first step is to tie the requirements of that position to the or organizational objectives and goals um, and see how that position actually contributes to what the organization hopes to achieve. That helps you define some more general competencies that are required for that position. Um, then when you want to go down and dive a little bit deeper into the kind of technical area, that's where you really have to do research on, you know, who are the, the subject matter experts who know a lot about this field, who would be able to predict what kind of skills might be required in a role like that. So it's really um, an investigative project. Yeah. You really have to dive deep, ask yourself who are the people who are experts in this area, who are going to know the most, um, and who can kind of predict what future skills are going to be required for that job. Absolutely. And 
not to turn this into a sales pitch, but obviously we do that kind of work a lot for our yeah, clients. Yeah, we do, for sure. Um, obviously, I'm in marketing, and I know we've done some really pretty cool work lately looking at the new requirement marketing competencies. So the, mm -hmm. the marketing field, the digital marketing field is changing at such a rapid pace. Yeah. So really looking at what those new skills that are required in, it's not an emerging area, but it's a, a rapidly evolving one for sure. Exactly, yeah. Um, similar as, you know, IT mm -hmm. and there's a number, you know, anything around artificial intelligence, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and we definitely do a lot of work doing that investigation on behalf of our clients and documenting and creating those competencies. And it's a continuous um, process. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Okay, so next question here is from Caitlin. Uh, so what is the best way to measure whether employee engagement is actually increasing? Okay, um, that's a good question. So yeah, I guess I'll start by saying it's important to first define employee engagement. It's a term that is thrown around a lot these days. Um, if you're actually looking at def defining the construct or the, the concept of engagement, it boils down to three different things. So the first thing being vigor. So do you come to work with a lot of energy during the day? Mm -hmm. um, dedication, do you find that uh, your job is meaningful and has significance to you? And then absorption. So if you might have heard the concept of flow, it's when you really kind of have your head down, you're immersed in work, mm -hmm. and you can really concentrate for large periods of time uh, and kind of avoid those distractions that we keep getting faced with in a work environment. Um, so when we're talking about engagement, we're talking about an individual who's feeling all those things at work. Um, and it's such a popular concept because when you're in that state, you can get, really get a lot done, you can contribute a lot, um, you're a lot more productive, and you're happier as well. You're healthier, happier, everything. Um, but when it comes down to actually determining if engagement has increased or not, uh, the traditional way of doing it is to run an employee-wide, uh, an organization-wide survey. Um, but to actually measure an increase, you have to do more than just one survey. So organizations will typically do a yearly or a, um, a biannual employee engagement survey. You can kind of track changes over time this way. Ideally, in my opinion, um, collecting data, less amounts of data um, more frequently. So maybe every three mm -hmm. months, maybe every month, asking just a few questions, you can really get a sense of whether engagement is going up or down. And more importantly, you can answer the question of why. Um, if engagement has gone up or if it's gone down, you really can't do too much about it uh, unless you actually you know, understand why that's happening. So it's, it's important to figure out you know, what changes might have happened in your organization between those two di different time periods and then what you can really do about it. Great, yeah, some great tips there too on how to do it more effectively. Okay, so this next question, uh, this just came in, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. So we hear this a lot from our clients. This is all great, but practic practically speaking, what can an organization do if they can't invest in competencies, especially given some uh, you know, recent things that are going on, like rising minimum wages uh, in Ontario, Alberta, and California? That's a good question. Um, yeah, so I've been going through the whole competency modeling process. Mm -hmm. uh, it does take time and it takes resources. Uh, I think at least switching your mindset to more of a, a competency-based mindset and yeah. thinking about how people can contribute strategically to your bottom line um, is at least a step in the right direction. At least switching your mindset and taking some steps to do it. Uh, you know, there are, you know, for, for an organization who can't necessarily afford to uh, go through the whole competency modeling process, there's a, there's yeah. a possibility to actually adopt some competencies um, and kind of, you know, choose the ones you want off the shelf. It's a, you know, a, a quicker exercise and may not be quite as intuitive to the organization, but it helps get you in the right direction. Um, and just using that kind of mindset, I think, is uh, it's, it's a good starting place at least. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there was a Oh, there was a case study we did and one of our clients um, that one of her biggest messages was you're never gonna get it right from the beginning right so it's better to start and you know get going down that path even though it's maybe not 100% where you'd want it to be and budgets are often a, a factor that lead towards not you know being able to get it all the way 100% perfect reflecting mm -hmm. all of your organization so you know, I think it's just some good advice that we've seen from a few different clients in terms of lessons learned. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so this question, 
going back to the previous one about engagement. Okay. Um, so how do competencies help to improve engagement? What's, what's that link really between competencies and engagement? So thank you, Andrea, mm. uh, for that question that just came in. That's a really good question. Um, so when you're in an organization and you, haven't, you have no sense of you know, what competencies you require to do your job, there's a lot of uncertainty there. Um, it can be uncomfortable for people. But if you have a very good sense of, like in my position, uh, if I know exactly what competencies I require to do the job, I'm able to actually assess myself based on what's required. Um, I can see kind of where my weak areas are and I can actually take steps to learn and fill in those gaps. Um, this helps me do better at my job. It helps me understand what's actually required of me. Um, if I come to work in the morning and I really don't know what's expected of me or I don't know what I should be doing, yes. that's an uncomfortable feeling. Um, but if you're actually able to define those competencies, you can come and be confident about what's required of you to do um, and you know the things you need to learn and things like that. Yeah. And so the, the net result of that is basically you can come to work with more confidence, uh, you know what you need to do, and there's just more clarity there overall. Yeah, great. Okay, so this is an interesting question. So okay. is there, this comes to us from Shane. Um, thanks Shane for the question. Is there a streamlined process for accelerating growth either vertically or horizontally for an employee through a competency-based assessment system. So this is all around okay. employee development. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's a bit of a mouthful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a good question though. So competencies do help with that. So applying it to a career development standpoint, um, it's kind of similar to what I was saying before in the sense of knowing what's required uh, of you in a given position except take that a step further and if you were able to, to model or, or figure out what are the competencies required in all these different positions in the organization, mm -hmm. you can actually map out a trajectory or a career plan for you and you know what skills you need, not now, but maybe two years from now, three years from now. Um, and you can actually map out where you want to go in the organization and this can actually help with less traditional traje career trajectories as well. So. For example, if you want to go from, let's say, the products department and you want to move to sales, mm -hmm. uh, what do I need to do to make that switch and make sure that when I hit the ground in sales, I'm actually you know, contributing right away? If you map the competencies in both products and sales, you can actually determine, okay, I have gaps here, here, and here, so I'll do some personal development, I'll do some learning, or maybe I'll request some training from my employer if they're offering that, mm -hmm. um, and then you can actually you know, make that transition. So. It speeds up the process in the sense that your learning is more directed, it's more focused, but then it also speeds things up in the sense that your career plan is a little more deliberate. So you're spending less time deciding where to go if you have all the information kind of at your fingertips and you know what path you want to choose. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, people bring more competencies than what's often defined in their current job profile. Absolutely. So looking at, and so this kind of goes back to one of the earlier questions around, you know, what's the match between competencies, an individual's competencies and an organizational, an organization's competencies. Um, if you, you can take a look at that picture a little bit more holistically of an individual and you can demonstrate how you, how you have demonstrated these competencies in the past beyond mm -hmm. your job current job requirements. I mean, I think it's a way to start looking at, you know, what those transferable skills are and where you can go uh, yeah. throughout the organization. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we've got one, we've got two minutes left. Uh, we're okay. gonna wrap up at 20 after, but I do have another question here. So this is a follow on from Andrew as well. So how can competencies be disseminated through throughout the organization by HR? So it's often dis difficult to schedule time for employee initiatives given the time needed for employees to complete their work. Yeah, that's a good question. And it's definitely a common barrier that companies have to actually implementing competency-based yeah, modeling. Sure. Uh, the key to any successful competency-based modeling intervention, it's an organizational development intervention, which means that it's not just defining competencies. The goal here is to actually do something with those competencies and improve the way um, HR functions the way the company functions. So the key there is really executive buy-in. You need to start from the top. You need to have top management explicitly saying, okay, let's set aside time out of everyone's job, you know, to buy into this, to spend the time helping to find competencies, 
uh, to learn about it, to become proficient in you know, the language surrounding competencies because there was a bit of a learning curve there. It's a different way of thinking about organizational performance and your job. Um, so it really has to come from the very, very top. If HR is championing it, that's excellent, but they need buy-in from the very top as well. It can be difficult to manage up and try and you know, set aside time for people who don't have time mm-hmm. if they're not provided it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's also a certain element, you know, putting on my marketing hat, uh, through your communications, how you're doing it, the what's in it for me. Yep. Um, you're really clearly communicating to employees as well as management, you know, as you with different positions throughout the organization, the benefits are, are different. Mm-hmm. Um, so for the various stakeholder groups, what are the benefits? Why should we be doing this? What they're really going to get out of it obviously goes a long way too in getting that buy-in and making sure that people do have the time to set aside to do it and want to take the time yeah, to do exactly. it as well. Yeah, you need buy-in from all parts, Yeah, for sure. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. So I think we're going to wrap up. We're at, uh, oh, we're past 20 after now. So thank you so much for everyone who tuned in live to, to listen today. Um, come back, check us out next month. We'll be back again with another edition of Competency Corner Live. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Uh, and we look forward to next month. Take care, everyone. Bye.